This poor pastry boy created an empire and helped make these two women the richest women on earth. Eugene Paul Louis Schuler was born in Paris in 1881, the son of two hardworking pastry shop owners. He was growing up to be an exceptionally studious and ambitious young man. He not only earned top grades in all his classes, but he also got up early to help his parents prepare the pastries every single day. A relatively unspectacular beginning for someone destined to build one of the world's greatest fortunes. After finishing his baccalaureate degree, which is roughly equivalent to two years of college, Eugene entered the Institute of Applied Chemistry in 1900. Once again, he succeeded brilliantly and finished first in his class. Following his graduation in 1904, he took a position as a laboratory assistant at the Sorbonne. It seemed like he was mapping out a career as a university researcher, but while that was highly respectable, it was hardly lucrative. Then something happened that would change the course of his life forever. One day, the owner of a large barber shop visited Eugene's lab. The man was seeking help in developing a synthetic hair dye. At the time, hair dyes were not widely used by French women, largely because most of the concoctions were toxic and irritated the scalp. Seeing a good business opportunity, Eugene agreed to become the barber's technical advisor. But even then, the ambitious young man hated the idea of working under someone else's orders. So soon, cut ties and struck out on his own. Eugene began experimenting with hair dyes in a rented space near the Tuileries Gardens. His first efforts were terribly disappointing, but convinced that his scientific insight could revolutionize the beauty industry, he persisted. Eugene continuously changed the formulas, and he even tried out the dyes on his own hair. While it took him a long time, he at last had a product that he felt happy about. Finally, I had the good fortune that I think I deserved, he wrote, to obtain a product of excellent quality that allowed me to at last launch my company. By now, it was the year 1909, and Eugene had been experimenting with hair dyes for two whole years. He founded the Société Française de Tentures Inoffensives pour Chevaux. But that was a mouthful. He soon changed it to L'Oréal. L'Oréal was both a homophone for Oreal, which was a popular hairstyle of the period, as well as a play on the word Oriole, or halo. Eugene established his company in a two-bedroom apartment. The dining room served as the demonstration room, and the bedroom was the laboratory. As a solo entrepreneur, Eugene did everything himself. Nights were spent manufacturing the products. Mornings were used to sell them to Parisian hairdressers and afternoons were for delivering the goods. To say that he was busy would be an understatement. But while he could not know it then, his little business would in time become the world's largest cosmetics firm. Eugene had created a technological breakthrough that promised high quality, risk-free products for women and it didn't take long before he began exporting his products abroad. From 1910, L'Oreal products were sold in Austria and Italy, and by 1914, an additional six markets had been added. Hungary, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. After World War I, Eugene began buying up beauty product companies, but by the 1930s, he had stretched his investments way beyond hair lotions and lipsticks. You see, Eugene was an obsessive worker and a restless thinker. He was always exploring new ideas about the economy and politics, and against the backdrop of the Great Depression, he came up with a new idea, the proportional salary. With this, he proposed that instead of paying workers an hourly or daily wage, their salary should be proportional to their production. 
Eugene was no fan of the leftist politics of France in the 1930s, and he was especially against the new reforms that had been pushed through, such as the five-day work week, graduated salary hikes, the nationalization of railroads, and the introduction of two-week paid vacations for all workers. But while he may have despised the reforms, seeing that L'Oreal's had just recently launched its very first sunscreen, Ombre Solaire, the annual paid leave actually turned out to be excellent for his business. Now French men and women from all classes of society were heading to the beaches and basking in the sun. And sales of Ombre Solaire skyrocketed. But that wasn't the only reason why L'Oreal was doing so well. Remember how we said that Eugene began expanding far beyond hair lotions and lipsticks? Well, during World War II, he also provided financial support and held meetings for La Cagoule at L'Oreal headquarters. La Cagoule was a violent French fascist-leaning and anti-communist group whose leader formed a political party which supported the Vichy collaboration with the Nazis. Thanks largely to his relations with the Germans, Eugene's fortune grew considerably during the war. Between 1940 and 1944, L'Oreal's sales nearly quadrupled, and Eugene's tax returns show that his personal net income increased nearly tenfold between 1940 and 1943. Eugene was a pioneering personality and a driven entrepreneur. Over the years, L'Oreal had managed to set the standard in the beauty industry, and despite Eugene's former ties to the Nazi regime, the brand had secured a loyal following among its target audiences. In 1957, however, Eugene passed away at the age of 76, and now it was up to his daughter, Lillianne, to continue her father's legacy. Or so it seemed. Lillianne was born in Paris in 1922, and she was the only child of Eugene and his wife, Louise. At 15, Lillianne became an apprentice at L'Oreal, where she was in charge of labeling bottles and mixing products. Fast forward to the year 1957, and a 35-year-old Lillianne just inherited the L'Oreal empire after her father's passing. Eugene was a man of action and creative spirit, and in addition to its traditional network of hair salons, L'Oreal was now an all-encompassing actor in the beauty industry, successfully diversifying its distribution channels through pharmacies. But like many big 1930s industrialists, Eugene also had an old-fashioned philosophy. In his view, women should stay at home and not take jobs from men, and to him, only money, not businesses, should be considered heritable. So, despite Lillianne inheriting all the money, she received none of the power. While Lillianne had inherited the L'Oreal empire, actually running the company fell to Francoise Dahl, who built the business into the multi-billion dollar company it is today. During the following years, L'Oreal grew immensely through acquiring other companies, and the brand's motto became Savoir ceci, ce qui commence, which means seize new opportunities. At the investigation of Chairman Francois Dahl, the company continued expanding internationally, and a number of strategic brand acquisitions marked the beginning of a period of spectacular growth and emblematic products. During the next three decades, several big brands were acquired, such as Lancome, Garnier, and Maybelline, and they also continued to invest millions in R&D. But while L'Oreal was increasingly getting more attention, Lillianne had always shunned media attention, and she granted very few interviews. She had arranged for her only child, Francoise, to inherit most of her vast fortune, as this is what French law dictates, and she was getting ready to live out her retirement on the interest, which amounted to several million dollars a month. Not bad, but a few nasty scandals were on their way. It all began in 2007, when Francoise launched a lawsuit against Lillianne's close friend and celebrity photographer, Francoise-Marie Bagnier. She accused him of swindling Lillianne 
and attempting to take a share of the family's fortune. According to her, Lillianne was in a weak mental condition and he had exploited her vulnerability to trick her into giving him money and gifts worth almost a billion dollars. The epic legal battle that followed triggered a feeding frenzy in the French media. It exposed the family's dark secrets to public scrutiny, threatened L'Oreal with a foreign takeover, and the mother-daughter relationship soured. The case later became known as the Betancourt Affair, and the saga would last until 2015. Banier was ultimately convicted for capitalizing on Lillian's struggle with dementia to gain family assets, and Lillian spent her final years in the fog of Alzheimer's, surrounded by her dogs, her caregivers, and her servants. At the time of her death in 2017, she was one month shy of her 95th birthday. And with a net worth of $44.3 billion, she was the richest woman and the 14th richest person in the world. For half a century, Eugene laid the groundwork for a company that would offer innovative products of unparalleled quality. And that's still the case today. L'Oreal continues to cement its position as the global leader in the beauty industry, and its products are currently sold in over 150 countries around the world. Each year, the company's consolidated sales generate billions of dollars. It owns more than 36 brands and produces thousands of products, including hair coloring, makeup, body and skin care, and perfume. And Francoise Betancourt? Well, her fortune is currently estimated to be over $80 billion. As the only granddaughter of Eugene Schuler, Francoise took over L'Oreal in 2017, following the death of her mother, Lillianne. But while she only inherited $39.5 billion, she managed to boost her wealth to unprecedented numbers. However, despite owning a 33% stake in L'Oreal, Francoise channels her time into something quite different from the cosmetics industry. As an academic who was raised Catholic, the heiress has penned books on everything from Greek mythology to the Bible. And everything tells me that this curious spirit of hers might be something that she inherited from her grandfather too. Had you already heard of the richest woman on earth? And is there a brand that you'd like us to cover next? Make sure to share it in the comments and don't forget to check out our channel for more inspiring business videos.